Hello, thanks for stopping by today's video uh, where we're going to be discussing acute kidney injury or uh, also acute renal failure. And we'll talk about the differences in a little bit. Uh, let's just get started with the definition. So uh, acute kidney injury and acute renal failure uh, is defined as any sort of abrupt loss of kidney function. And so how do we know when the kidney is not functioning? Uh, one is uh, allegoria, which is low uh, urination, but also uh, increased BUN and creatinine or any um, abnormalities in the volume and the electrolytes. So this is a general definition of uh, both of these terms. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and start talking about, well, what is the difference between acute kidney injury and acute renal failure? So in acute kidney injury, uh, this is uh, defined as uh, any type of small incremental loss of kidney function. Um, so that's acute kidney injury. So how does that differentiate from acute renal failure? So acute renal failure is organ failure. So what this means is the kidney is no longer functional and it no longer works. So in acute kidney injury, um, just a small type of damage to the kidneys, it can, it, but it hasn't failed yet. But in acute renal failure, we're saying the kidney is completely damaged. You could think of it as a more severe acute kidney injury, uh, but you know, just kind of keep those um, in mind. And so when we talk about uh, everything that we talk about here, it's going to apply to both of them. Uh, however, um, acute renal failure would be like a late stage. Uh, but currently, the, uh, mo the term that's going to be used most often is uh, acute kidney injury. However, I kept uh, acute renal failure just in case you, you know, come across that, you know what, what it is. So uh, let's talk about the pathogenesis or the pathophysiology here of um, how this uh, acute kidney injury or acute renal failure works. So it's divided into three different categories depending on where it affects the kidneys. Pre-renal, which is before the kidneys. Intrinsic, which means the kidneys itself, so somewhere along the nephron or the glomerulus, and post-renal is um, after the after the collecting tubules, so collecting tubules and anywhere below that, that includes the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. So, what are the effects of pre-renal? So, when you think of pre-renal, you're thinking of any type of drop in blood flow for whatever reason, and we'll talk about the different reasons there. In intrinsic, you talk about some sort of renal damage, and that can be the glomerulus or the tubules. And finally, in post-renal, um, it's going to be some sort of obstruction. And so, you know, we, we're talking about stones here, strictures, and uh, fibrosis. So to understand the pathophysiology more accurately, let's actually draw a diagram of the kidney. So here I've drawn the uh, glomerulus here. Um, and then here's a Bowman capsule around it. Uh, now proximal convoluted tubule. And then here's a loop of Henle. So it's descending and ascending loop. And then finally, we have the distal co um, convoluted tubule. And there's the collecting ducts. So as we know, um, as you have blood flow coming in, um, this blood is going to then get filtered into the kidneys. And so you get um, filtration. Of course, this filtration is called the GFR. So what happens in um, pre-renal, when you have low blood flow, you also get uh, low GFR. And that's represented here. So right now we have um, a lot of GFR. And so as the blood flow decreases, the GFR becomes lower and lower. So now, ha now having a GFR, what does that mean? So when you have low renal blood flow, uh, this is going to decrease the glomerular filtration rate. And so what this will do is, um, when the glomerular filtration rate is low, uh, this is going to activate the re re renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So what is, what is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system? I mean, it's, it's a, it has a lot of effects, but uh, overall, with related to pre-renal failure or, or acute kidney injury, um, it's going to increase the amount of sodium and water reabsorption. So as, this, um, as you have low GFR, the kidney starts to believe, wait a minute, maybe I don't have that much uh, fluid in the body, because that's what it interprets it as. So it begins to uptake more sodium and more water um, here and aldosterone is going to act on the distal to again um, take up more sodium and more water so that's H2O so as the urine is flowing here uh, we get um, urine which is highly concentrated because all of the sodium and water have been removed
Now, not only is uh, sodium and water affected, but there are also some of the other solutes are also affected because uh, reabsorption in general just increase. So one of the markers for, cre uh, for you know, glomerular filtration rate is going to be creatine. So they both are markers for creatine, but they're slight different. Uh, sorry, they both are markers for glomerular filtration rate, but they're a little different. Uh, creatine goes, gets uh, freely filtered to the glomerulus. It goes all the way around and it leaves the urinary tract there. And actually at the distal convoluted tubule, you actually get some secretion in of uh, creatine. On the other hand, BUN is a little different. So BUN does get freely filtered. It goes through the um, glomerulus here to the tubules and it goes outside the um, urinary tract. However, BUN does get reabsorbed. So BUN does get reabsorbed normally and creatine does not. Creatine gets completely removed with no reabsorption. Uh, so what does that mean for us? So let's first look at the serum here. So if we're looking at the serum, okay, what would you expect the creatine to be? Well, again, there's going to be less filtration going on, so you're going to expect an increase in creatine. Okay, now what do you expect about the BUN? Well, there's also, because there's less filtration going on overall, there's going to be less BUN being filtered. So they'll be in the same, uh, same boat here. However, BUN is then going to be reabsorbed along with the sodium and the water that we talked about earlier. So you would expect BUN to be much, much higher than creatine. So in the pre-renal uh, uh, pre -renal failure, you're going to have elevated creatine and elevated BUN, but the BUN will be elevated at a higher ratio than the creatine. And this is going to help us, uh, help us later as we'll talk about. Now, how about the urine? What, what are you going to expect in the urine? First, um, you're going to expect oliguria because the, the body is not producing that much urine because the amount filtered initially is going to be low. Um, the other thing is, remember, the sodium is being reabsorbed. So it will have low sodium. And the um, urine will be highly concentrated. And, uh, you know, the, I guess the scientific way to say highly concentrated is to say high osmolality. And so if you take a look at this, um, I mean, this isn't necessarily a pathology. I mean, the kidneys, this is what they're supposed to do uh, whenever you have low blood flow or hypotension or anything like that. And so when you look at the causes, you'll see that the causes will be fairly consistent with uh, kind of normal uh, response of the kidney. So now let's move our attention to the intrinsic. So here, as you can see, I've drawn the same kidney here. We have the uh, arterial, um, arterial, afferent arterial, efferent arterial. Here's our uh, glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and then you know the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and then there's your uh, final pathway there that goes out to the ureter. So what happens in renal damage is um, you actually have damage to these glomerular areas over here. So what does that mean? Well, the first thing that it means is they lose function. And so remember, one of the function was that they reabsorb sodium and water. So you're not able to reabsorb the sodium, and so you end up losing a lot of sodium and maybe even water, depending on the situation. Now, the, the water will be you know, different, because if it's a glomerular issue, you might, not, you might even get allegoria. But still, as you can imagine, it, it will be more dilute than with pre-renal failure where the uh, tubular cells are intact and they're working fine. So in the intrinsic renal failure scenario, uh, we have a decrease in tubular function, which leads to an increase in sodium and water excretion. Now, this also not only has effect on sodium and water, but it also has effect on your BUN and creatinine. So, just like before, as you had here, uh, your creatine is going to get go through and it's going to go just as normal. However, um, your and your and your BN will go through just as normal. So, as we already know, creatine doesn't get reabsorbed. So you wouldn't affect, you wouldn't expect too much of effect on creatine. However, the B, uh, BUN used to get reabsorbed, and now it no longer can anymore. 
so it can't get any uh, absorbed anymore. So what does that mean? Well, when it comes to the uh, serum levels, you're going to have an elevated creatine and you're going to have an elevated BUN, but they will be they, they won't be as significant difference between these two as there is in pre-renal uh, failure. So one of the best ways to uh, d differentiate between uh, pre-renal and intrinsic is look at the ratio of difference between the creatine and BUN. In pre-renal, the, cre the ratio difference will be uh, 20 to 1, and in uh, intrinsic, so it'll be greater than that, and intrinsic, it tends to be less than 15 to 1. So I wish I wrote that first, but you guys get the idea. And when it comes to the urine, uh, you're going to have a high amount of sodium and a lot of uh, uh, of water being excreted, uh, and, and that's and it's going to be very dilute. And why is that? Because we're used to uh, you know what what helps the urine become concentrated is the actual tubular cells, which are no longer working, so it's not going to be able to get concentrated anymore. Now, post renal, what this tends to have to do with is uh, some type of obstruction uh, at the end. So we'll, do, we'll draw a picture here as well. So in post renal, uh, you have a problem either here at the collecting ducts or even further, uh, say, in the uh, ureter, uh, the bladder, or the urethra. So you can have an obstruction anywhere along this pathway. And obstruction could be for many reasons. Uh, it could be due to, you know, benign prosthetic hyperplasia in men. Uh, it could be due to a type of stricture. Uh, or some type of stone, and even fibrosis, and we'll get to all that. But how does it present? Well, what, with, with post-renal, uh, it generally begins with a pre-renal type of issue. Because it's, it's, again, the function of, so if we look over here, initially the function of the actual kidneys is normal. So it's going to more be like a pre-renal, but eventually it's going to start affecting the distal uh, it, like intrinsic parts of the kidneys and so then later it's going to be uh, more like an intrinsic failure so we won't go into too much besides just saying it's obstruction we might go over some etiology but that's as far as we need to go for that so now let's go ahead and talk about the uh, etiology here so first of all uh, pre-renal is the most common cause of acute kidney injury or acute renal failure and not only is it a, is it a cause for I guess pre renal cause for pre renal failure, but it can eventually if it's if it's long standing it can actually lead to intrinsic renal failure, and that's because the blood flow that comes in through the um, you know renal blood flow not only you know is used for filtration but then afterwards it's used to provide blood for the tubular cells and so you can get um, intrinsic failure there so that's uh, something to keep in mind so uh, the pre renal again it has to do with blood flow so one of the things that can occur is if you get volume deletion overall depletion overall in the body so what can cause volume depletion it depends on the different organs uh, and, and the way you lose fluids so if according to say for example uh, the kidneys the renal system um, this can be due to a patient taking too much diuretics and you know that gets involved in volume depleted or polyurea so maybe diabetes insipidus you know without taking the uh, enough water intake um, another cause would be the GIT so this would be vomiting and diarrhea so that's uh, pretty obvious that can lead to volume depletion uh, through the skin cutaneous and this is very common in burn patients as well as patients who get Steven Johnson syndrome and as well as that, you get uh, hemorrhage and even pancreatitis, uh, ha you know, for third spacing has been known for that. Uh, so uh, besides volume depletion, you can also get hypo hypoperfusion. So in hypoperfusion, uh, you have enough blood, you have enough fluids, but you're just not able to perfuse all of your organs, including your kidneys. So the, the most common or, or the most obvious cause would be shock, right? Because that's kind of the definition. Uh, and this could either be uh, hypovolemic shock, which would be, I guess, volume depletion, which would lead to shock, hyperperfusion, or even sepsis, which would be normal volume there. Um, decreased cardiac output, such as heart failure, pulmonary embolism, uh, myocardial infarctions, and valvular disease, these can also uh, cause hypoperfusion with the kidneys. And renal artery stenosis is also another one. Um, so in this case, in renal artery stenosis, you don't have hyper hypoperfusion of the entire body. It's only the hypoperfusion of the kidneys. And so the kidney doesn't know better, it just thinks that the whole body's in trouble, so it'll start doing that. And this can um, 
either be due to atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia. So these are two conditions that you want to keep in mind. These are also associated with some syndromes, such as uh, neurofibromatosis type 1, Williams, and Allegalli syndrome. So uh, these are some syndromes to keep in mind uh, because renal artery stenosis uh, is kind of rare. So you, know, you want to, as soon as you do see it, these are some things you want to definitely put in mind right away. And finally, we have the edematous state. So uh, they have enough blood fluid, um, blood and fluid. They just uh, are third spacing, so it's going into the incorrect area. And this, of course, it does occur in heart failure, as well as uh, cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome when they lose too much proteins to and you know decrease the oncotic pressure. So these are the causes of pre-renal failure. So now what we'll do is we'll switch our uh, focus into uh, intrinsic renal failure. So first, remember that uh, pre-renal Failure is a cause of intrinsic renal failure, so keep that in mind. Um, and then what we'll do is we we'll kind of go um, to the different parts of the kidneys, because now we're talking about intrinsic kidneys, right? So the first we'll talk about the blood flow to the kidney, so the vascular causes. Um, so vascular causes uh, will include, so let's write that one, okay. So vascular causes will include malignant hypertension, um, which can uh, occlude the vessels after a long period of time. Um, and also uh, TTP, uh, hemoc uh, sorry, hemorrhagic, hem hemolytic uremic syndrome, and even DIC. So these are all can affect the vascular, and these are also known as uh, microangiopathic uh, disorders. So that's something to keep in mind. So after the vascular, next we have the glomerulus. So glomerulopathies can cause uh, renal failure, and these would be your nephritic syndrome and your nephrotic syndromes. Um, don't want to go into all of them, but um, you can definitely review that in the other video that I have. Um, so after glomerular causes, then we're going to look at tubular causes. So this would be anywhere between the proximal distal tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, or even the loop of Henle. So what are tubular causes? Um, first, it can be due to heme, which is uh, you know one of the uh, products of uh, hemoglobin, and this is generally due to rhabdomyolysis, which is the breakdown of muscle, uh, and that can be associated with statins or, or anything like that, even some type of crush injury. Uh, crystal, crystallopathies such as gout, um, you know, these are common in tumor lysis syndromes, seizures where they get a lot of breakdown, um, hypervitaminosis C, as well as some drugs such as acyclovir, uh, indinavir, which is the part of the heart regimen, and uh, methotrexate. So, and then finally, we have some, you know, cytotoxic drugs which are, can affect the tubules. Uh, these are going to be uh, aminoglycosides, the antibiotics. Uh, amphotericin B, which is an antifungal. We also have uh, pentamidine, uh, which is an, uh, another drug, cisplatin, and iphosphamide, which are both uh, anti uh, chemotherapeutics. And finally, you have the radio contrast material that's sometimes used in uh, imaging. So these are all your tubular causes. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. And finally, we'll talk about the interstitial causes, so the area that's between, you know, the, uh, right around the tubules. And so this can be pyelonephritis, which is an infection, or some type of systemic disease. And so these systemic diseases might be chagrin syndrome, uh, sarcoidosis as well, uh, lupus, and then we also have uh, tumor lymphomas and leukemia. So those are the other two. And finally, there are some drugs that can cause interstitial disease. Uh, these would be uh, penicillin cephalosporin. So these are antibiotics to keep in mind. Uh, NSAIDs and proton pump inhibitors. And finally, we have uh, allopurinol and uh, rifampin. So these are your drug causes for um, intrinsic. So finally, let's talk about uh, post-renal. So when we're talking about obstruction, um, you can have unilateral obstruction, obstruction. However, these oftentimes will present as normal creatine. And that's because you, you're affecting one kidney, but the other kidney can co compensate. And just because you have one kidney doesn't mean everything's still okay because you still can have a significant uh, glomerular filtration rate loss and that can lead to you know, uh, more problems uh, later on and eventually failure. So where can you have, where can you have obstructions? Well, one could be, um, you, know, you can have in the ureter, you could have it in your bladder, bladder and neck, and then you can even have the urethra. So um, in the ureter, it's pretty much pretty straightforward. We have stones, fibrosis and stricture. So uh, a stone, of course, we know calcium stones. Um, fibrosis can also occur, especially post-surgical, and the strictures, uh, do, again, due to some other type of damage. Uh, for, for, you know, the bladder neck, uh, we can have BPH, prostate cancer, and actually BPH and prostate cancer should be down the neck. Let me fix that real quick. Okay, so now that is better. So uh, 
bladder causes will be like neurogenic bladder. So the bladder is not contracting, and so you're getting obstruction. Uh, the bladder neck causes will be benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer. And finally, we have the urethral causes, which is similar to urethral causes, that stricture, um, and, and, and uh, of course, stones and all that, as it gets down there. But you also have tumors, and you can have phimosis. So that's kind of a few extra uh, items there. So uh, now that we've talked about the different causes, let's talk about um, the lab workup. So um, the first thing that you want to look at is the BUN and creatinine. So, um, and actually, before I begin, um, generally with the lab, you would, you're trying to differentiate between pre-renal and intrinsic. And post-renal, because they present so, because there's some type of obstruction, they present so differently that it's not necessary to necessarily differentiate them from these two. So we'll deal with post-renal separately, and actually we won't deal with it much, so um, we'll get to that. So for right now, I just want you guys to focus on pre-renal and intrinsic. So first, the BUN and creatinine ratio. Like I explained before, in pre-renal, there is higher reabsorption of BUN. And so you will have a greater than 20 to 1 ratio between BUN and creatinine, whereas intrinsic, it'll be less than a 15 to 1 ratio as it's not able to reabsorb that BUN. Uh, we also have the factor excretion of sodium. And so this is going to be how much sodium is excreted uh, compared to uh, creatine. And so in pre-renal, it'll be less than 1% because of course the sodium is being reabsorbed so you, you're removing more creatine than sodium. And in intrinsic, since you're not reabsorbing the sodium, it'll be greater than 2%. Um, next, we can look at the urine sodium level. So uh, again, with pre-renal, it's going to be less than 20 milliequivalents per liter, whereas in intrinsic, it's going to be greater than 20. And the urine osmolality, it's going to be high here, more than 500 and intrinsic is going to be right around 300, which is plasma level. And, find, uh, and actually, I did forget to mention something. What is um, fractional excretion of sodium, and how do you calculate it? Well, what it is, is you're comparing how much, the, what fraction of sodium is being excreted compared to what fraction of creatine is being excreted. So first you need to figure out what is the fraction of creatine, and the way you do that is you, cal you divide the, um, the amount of urinary creatine by the plasma creatine. So that gives you some ratio. And so that's going to be your denominator, and you're, what you're going to be dividing this over is the fraction of sodium. And so again, to find the fraction of sodium, you take the urinary sodium and divide it by the um, plasma sodium. So another way to write it down, because um, you know there's a lot of fractions there, is just calculate the urinary sodium divided by the plasma sodium, and then divide that by the urinary creatinine and the plasma creatinine. And so and you multiply that by 100, and you'll get a percent. So um, this is how the urine, a, fr a fraction of uh, excreted sodium is, is found. And so, of course, in pre-renal, it will be less than 1%. And in intrinsic, it will be greater than 2%. So um, that's, and then you also can do uh, your analysis. So urine analysis, it will be normal in pre-renal uh, because your analysis generally detects intrinsic problems. And in, in intrinsic, you will get um, tubular cell casts. And these tubular cell casts are formed uh, from the tubules. So if you go up here... So again, when you, get, when you get damage to these tubules over here, they tend to fall in and form these casts which eventually get excreted. So if you see tubular cell casts, it's probably going to be uh, acute tubular necrosis. And finally, if there's heme, um, the, the urine will be red or brown. So in post-renal, um, this again is due to some type of obstruction. So imaging plays a large role. Um, I mean, you do get some slight hematuria in all these things if it's a stone, but you know, primarily you want to do a CT scan. And so of course, this is a whole other topic of stones and obstruction, so that will be for another video, hopefully. Okay, so we, now that we've diagnosed them uh, and looked at the different causes, let's talk about the treatment. Um, the first thing that you do when you, when you have a patient present with this is you, give, you check the fluid and electrolytes, and if there's any abnormalities there, you go ahead and fix that first. Um, so make sure you keep that in mind there. Um, then you try to address any reversible causes. Um, so if anything that can... Uh, be fixed, go ahead and fix that. Um, if it's some type of chronic cause or something that can't be addressed right now, then you're probably going to just do supportive until they get over what, whatever problem they have. Um, and so there's a few, in, in, when you're doing supportive therapy, there's a few derangements that are caused by renal failure that need to be addressed. One of the things that you'll have is you'll have volume overload. And that's just because you're not urinating enough, and so you're, you're, the blood is going to stay in your body, especially if they continue to eat and drink water and, and do all that. So if you do get volume overload, furosemide is your answer. And if it, if it doesn't always respond to furosemide, but if it does respond to furosemide, 
that's a good prognosis. So something to keep in mind. Uh, hyperkalemia is another problem that you would have, and um, again, this uh, this occurs due to uh, not being able to excrete the potassium, and sometimes you have damage to some body part, uh, and or, or you have damage to tissues, and they're releasing potassium, but your body can't remove it. Um, in these situations, depending on severity, you can do a few different things. Uh, one thing you can do is just lower the potassium in the tube or you know their feed, so that way you can um, try to offset the accumulation that might be there. Uh, another way to do it is to give them some uh, potassium binding resin. And of course, you can also what you can also do is give them insulin, dextrose, or even beta agonists. And uh, what do these do? Well, they tend to push the potassium into the cell, and um, so that can decrease the amount of potassium in the vessels. So that's one way to go about it. And finally, if nothing is working, you can finally do dialysis. So that's uh, kind of the last ditch effort. Um, the renal failure also can lead to acidosis, and so bicarb is your answer there. And finally, if there's any bleeding going on or loss of blood, then you want to do transfusions until you can um, take care of that blood. Now, um, of course, one of the problems is that you, you're not getting enough blood to the kidneys. So many people have theorized that maybe you can give uh, dopamine or phenaldepam, uh, which actually dilates the um, renal arterioles. However, um, there is no convincing evidence as of yet, and some evidence has actually shown that it's actually worse off. So not really sure what's going on there, but that's not something you want to do at the moment. So you do supportive therapy. Now, there is some time where you, do, where you want to do dialysis. Now, overall, you do not, you want to try to avoid dialysis as much as possible because it does delay recovery, but there's certain indications that you do need to do it. Um, one of those indications is if uh, they have fluid overload and it's refractory to diuretic. So that's one there. Um, not only that, but if they have hyperkalemia, so that's two diuretics. If they have hyperkalemia, that's also refractory. And we kind of already discussed, you know, once you give uh, insulin and beta agonists, then, you know, the next step after that is a diuretics, a, a dialysis. Then if, uh, also if acidosis is refractory. Uh, so as you can tell, basically, if it's refractory to supportive treatment, then you just go to dialysis. And finally, if the uh, azotemia also has high BUN, is really high. So if it's at 80 to 100, you want to do it, or if the patient starts to develop uremia, which means that you know they, they have so much uh, nitrogenous products they can't even convert it into uh, BUN. So those would be um, your indication for dialysis, uh, and, and dialysis is pretty much end of the road as far as treatment goes, that's the last line of treatment. So what is a prognosis? Um, a prognosis depends um, on what is causing it, because you know there's tons of causes like we've already discussed earlier, and if they have comorbidities and also people of older age uh, tend to not do so well. So what can happen? Well, recovery. So first, it, it is possible to recover completely, and people who do recover generally recover in two weeks. Um, however, sometimes you, people do develop, go into chronic kidney disease, and they can also go eventually go into end-stage renal disease, never healing from it, and this is most common in patients who um, have, been, have been having um, acute renal failure for six to eight weeks and haven't showed much improvement or they're continuing to deteriorate.